languages are definitely not natural languages. I don't think anyone needs me to elaborate on that. But code is often sprinkled about with natural language bits inside of it. As I assume most listeners already know, this includes, but is not limited to, comments in the code. In basically every language above assembly languages, there's some mechanism for including sections of text inside your code, which are going to be ignored by the compiler, or by the interpreter, or the transpiler, or whatever sort of piler you've got these days. Off the top of my head, I can't remember how you do them in Lisp. But other than that, every language. It's a convenient way to document your code with nothing other than natural language. How easy is that? Of course, not every programmer does it. And of those that do, not all of them do it well. We've all been guilty of that. But despite the fuzziness about the usefulness of these comments, Let's acknowledge there's a huge amount of natural language data sitting baked inside most code bases, not being put to much use beyond the occasional grep statement crafted to find some area in need of a bit more attention. In addition to comments, many languages support more formal metadata. Python, for example, supports a concept called doc strings. A doc string is a string declared with triple quotes at the beginning and the end and always placed as the first line in a class or a function. There's a few other technicalities and formalities you should be aware of if you're a Python coder, but I'm not going to get into that here. A good doc string describes what a function does, not the manner in which it does it. In nicer IDEs, they have clever ways of capturing this and providing hints to the coder about the functionality of various methods they might be accessing. And beyond that, there's some really cool tools out there that can automatically turn code or turn the doc strings and things like that into formal documentation. Do that dynamically, so it auto-updates. They give you a free, nice CSS thing so you can get through it. Great stuff. But beyond that, it's still mostly just basic text search, at least in the stuff I've encountered. A third and final category here are commit messages. The messages coders write to describe the bundle of changes they're going to make and push to source control, which if you're doing the commit messages correctly, and many of you are not, they're meant to describe the gist of the functionality you're adding, or the bug you're fixing. And again, searchable, but not usually in anything more than what you do with Elasticsearch or some other full text search tool. But it does seem like a commit message might be a lot more useful, doesn't it? And what about the comments and the doc strings? You know, there's a vast corpora just sitting there of open source projects and publicly visible projects of code. Sure, it's messy, but it's big. And couldn't there be something novel you would do with that, linking the language to the code? In the most lazy way possible, I've thought about this a lot in my life, or I've thought about thinking about it. I've taken literally no action to do anything. And that's why I was thrilled to come across a great post on the GitHub engineering blog titled Towards Natural Language Semantic Code Search. That's by Hamil Hussein, who we're going to talk to today, and co-author Ho Xiang Wu. But before we get into that, a quick section some of you might feel free to skip if you're a more advanced senior level data scientist. But for those of you who won't hit the plus 30 second button a few times, let's have some quick mini mini episodes here and prep for some of the concepts that are going to come up in this interview. And let's start with cosine distance. I bet most listeners know this one. The sort of a measure of the distance between two angles or two vectors. Okay, well, in what space? In your basic math class, it's in the plane of your piece of paper, the x and the y. We can picture that in three dimensions. Most of us can't draw it, nor can we picture it in four dimensions. You could argue color and time and things like that, but, you know, not really. But there's lots of spaces out there for whatever you're doing, however many parameters you need to fully specify it, that's a space. Span of all values within that space. And the topic of embedding spaces is going to come up an awful lot in this series. And I owe you a deeper dive on it, that's definitely coming. So for now, when you hear us talk about embeddings and word to vec and that sort of thing, we'll get to it. If you need the high level, here it is. Algorithms like word to vec are well, they're based on neural networks, but really they're especially good mappings. Mappings that are learned in an unsupervised fashion, usually. 
a mapping from your text to some vector space. And these vector spaces, they might as well be random numbers in a way. They aren't quite intuitive, but they're effective. You can take any text, find out where it belongs in that vector space, and if it's constructed in a useful way, well, things that are near one another share a similar meaning. Things that don't share a similar meaning are distant from one another. We'll be getting to all that in just a few weeks. Last note here, seek to seek models, which we're also going to get to a little bit after that. These are a fancy new technique for mapping between two sequences. They've proven very effective in translation, so something like English to Spanish, maybe even Python to R, who knows. They're also neural network models, just in a different architecture than the word to vec one. That ought to keep you covered for this episode. Let's get into the interview. My name's Hamil Hussein. I'm currently a data scientist focusing on machine learning at GitHub. Most listeners are going to know about GitHub. I, I don't know how you couldn't if you're interested in data and uh, technology and things like that. I imagine there's a lot of interesting projects to work on there. What sort of specific things do you get into in general? Me specifically, what I'm working on right now is representation learning of code. You know, you might see in machine learning how to extract features from images or extract features from natural language. Code is, it's not a natural language. It's something different. It's a different animal in itself. It kind of looks like natural language in that it's text. You know, there's a lot of natural language inside code, comments. Even code itself contains some semantics like variable names have mm -hmm. meaning and things like that. But there's also structured code. And it's sort of thinking about how to learn representations of code so that we can do some downstream tasks like classify bits of code in, into certain categories or to automatically detect bugs or to do things like search, um, you know, like semantic search of code and all kinds of other things that I haven't thought of doing yet. You know, so that's the kind of research that I'm, I've been working on more recently. Uh, I'd love to delve into more of this comparison of code versus natural language. Uh, you point out a couple interesting comparisons. You know, I, I thought of, in my mind, there were two big ones. One is that it seems like you get an advantage because code is very well structured. You know, it has syntax and the compiler will reject a lot of things. Whereas in English, you know, people are very forgiving. I don't even have to speak in complete sentences and we can probably understand each other. Yet, on the other hand... If I look at any text of an English paragraph, I can generally kind of get the sense of it on one read, but I've looked back at some of my code from years ago and I literally have no idea what it's doing. So how apples to apples of a comparison is it to look at techniques we might apply to natural language versus apply to code? A lot of times the first thing that folks do when they're um, looking at code and you know trying to do things uh, like the things I described, like search or uh, classification of code is to actually just treat code as natural language. And the reason they do that is because there's a lot of tools and pipelines and and things like that already set up for natural language because people have been are working on natural language in the wild. And the kind of the, to set a baseline, oftentimes uh, what we can we could do is just you know to kind of see what happens when you treat code as natural language and at least start from there. And then try to improve on that, try to inject your domain knowledge about code, and then try to make incremental improvements on that. So one of the first things that really caught my attention when I reached out to you was a project you're working on doing a semantic search for GitHub. Can you, uh, maybe for people who don't know, first start with a definition of what is semantic search? So right now, when you search for code on GitHub, it's keyword search. So either you have to be familiar with the syntax that you're looking for, or you have to be able to anticipate what comments might be around the code that you're searching for. There might not even be comments in the code. And even if they are, you know, there might not be a match between the keywords in your query and the keywords in the comments or the code. And so we could do better than that. The idea of semantic search of code is can we search code semantically for sort of a general meaning of what, you know, what the code is doing? And that's not sensitive to keywords. So that, you know, if you try, if you type in the word sort or the word order, it kind of bring you to the same place. And you can find the code that, that does that, even if there's no intersection between any of the tokens in your query and the code. And that sounds magical, but there's actually techniques that we can use to try to attack that problem. 
I guess the problem for me became very relevant the other day when I was working on a project, and somewhere in the project,、uh, some bit of code was closing a Kinesis stream, and I did not want it to do that, and I had no idea where it was happening. I did a plain old text search for dot close, and that brought me too many things, and I couldn't think of the names of the variables that were probably used, so I was sort of stuck. What might I have been able to type in that, in theory, could have found、uh, that exact point I was looking for? Ah, so the idea with semantic search is you would type in that exact thing, the exact phrase, closing Kinesis stream, and then the idea is you would be able to find the code that does that. So I couldn't find it. What about the system you're envisioning would allow that system to find it? Ah, so the the system I'm envisioning would map code into in in language, both into a common representation, so that when you write a query. You can find code that is semantically close to your query terms, and I can get into how exactly we would do that. But that's the the general idea. When things are semantically close in English, I feel like I have a good understanding of that. Saying、uh, I need to give my pet a bath versus I need to take the bird to a shower, you know, human beings can hear that and say, "Oh, it's the same idea."、Uh, in code, is it a direct translation? Is it just that you know I can have a for loop or a while loop, and effectively they're the same thing if the logic all works out? It's a little bit more complicated, and your intuition is correct. It's not as straightforward, let's say, as natural language. However, from you know machine learning standpoint, there's lots of data in the wild, labeled data, and the reason it's labeled is there's tons of code in open source and on public repositories out there that have comments. We can effectively use that to train models that can learn a correspondence between language and code, and that is kind of the general idea of how you can try to map language and code together. So, by seeing many different examples of language and code, we can try to generalize over the space and you know make it such that you can write a query and then find code that does that. And a query that's not sensitive to your keywords because you have seen in the data many different variants of language, and you can refine that. And there's a lot of other approaches, but this I'm just kind of trying to give like high level intuition. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it it really was startling to me when I first read your blog post about the opportunity. There are so many public projects on GitHub. That's a huge data set.、Um, you know what a great opportunity to go in and maybe do some mapping like you're describing. But it also occurs to me that despite the fact that you have commit messages and you have code comments and in Python you have doc string and similar things like that in lots of languages, there is a lot of English there sitting next to the text. In fairness,、uh, I can't say that I always have left the best comments in my code or the clearest doc strings and that sort of thing. Is there any cleanup step you have to do to find code that is well described in the、uh, English annotations or any language annotations? I guess. My short answer to that is, there's definitely tons of noise. You know that is exactly what I suppose like machine learning will help us out with, is to kind of find the patterns, even though that there's a lot of noise in the data. Generally speaking, don't really clean up the comments so much,、um, and just kind of leave them as they are. With the general idea, there's so much data that you're still able to learn patterns over the entire corpus. Earlier in the show, we'll have had a little intro where we talk about word to vec and embedding, so we can trust that listeners have at least a, a very high level background in that. I believe you employ embeddings pretty heavily in the project. Can you describe how you put those to work? I would do want to mention that the technique I describe in the blog post is a little bit different than the technique that I'm experimenting with currently. It, the blog basically uses as a as the data set functions and methods. Paired with their doc strings, so in Python, traditionally as a convention, when you declare a function or a method, you know you can describe a one-line summary of what that function does. Now it's not mandatory that you do that, but that's just a Pythonic convention, and so it's not always there, but it occurs a lot, and so that's the kind of the data set that we're that we're using in this example in the blog. We need to represent language as an embedding. Specifically, these doc strings. So, kind of in contrast to the word embeddings, where you have an embedding for each word, we want to find a way to create an embedding for the sentence or that one-line doc string. And similarly, we want to create an embedding for the code. You know, we want to have some fixed-length embedding for the code as well. 
And the idea is, can we learn an embedding for both the doc string and the code such that when you have some sentence that corresponds to code that does this, that thing, then you can learn that embedding will be very similar. And by similar, I mean in some kind of mathematical sense. So in the blog, I use cosine distance. And the architecture in the blog basically forces a neural network to try to learn an embedding for both code and text that forces them into the same embedding space. And so the way I do it in the blog is actually, first, I kind of pre-train a model that learns to produce the doc string itself from code, uh, a sequence sequence model. That just means that we take a, an input sequence, which is a code, and we try to predict like some output sequence, which is text, the doc string. Inside that model, you have some hidden representation of the code, and that is used to produce the doc string. So basically, we borrow that, and we say, okay, we have learned an encoder for this code, something that can take this code and produce an embedding en route to doing the doc string. But we don't really care about the doc string. It was just fun to show that in the blog. Similarly, you know, we I took a different model, a language model. And language model is just a model that given n words, can you, produ can you predict the next word? Just for ease of understanding, I took all the doc strings in the corpus, concatenated them all together, and kind of chopped them up into a very specific way and said, okay, can I, I'm just going to let a model read this these doc strings. Um, I'm going to try to predict the next word in the doc string, and I'm going to slide like a sliding window over all of this. It's kind of like word to vec in the sense that you learn associations between uh, words. And essentially, I just take that model, and I take some internal state of that model, and I basically average the word embeddings of the sentence. That's not really what, it's not word embeddings, but we just, for simplicity and just for sake of understanding, let's just say, I use this language model to create this embedding for the, the doc string. So I have one model that does embedding for the doc string. I have one model that can create an embedding for code, but they're two separate models. They're, they're for two separate purposes of embeddings don't relate to each other. But then I kind of take that model that where I produce the doc strings, and I know it works because I can inspect the doc strings can see that it's producing sensible doc strings. Instead of producing doc strings, can you predict the embedding for the doc string? So I just replace the target variable instead of being the doc string, the embedding for the doc string. So then what that gives me is a model that can map code to an embedding. The model that maps code to the embedding, that embedding is in the same space as natural language because that's the one that's the embedding from the language model. I know this is a lot of things I'm saying. Maybe it's confusing. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, I don't know if it's easy to explain this without pictures or visual right, aid. Right. Um, well, but I, I hope, yeah. I'm following because I read the excellent blog post and, and some of the figures that are there. But I think, yeah, we've got a couple of translation steps to find sort of, uh, what does that vector space look like then? The one that shares code and language. Can you tell us a little bit about that space, you know, the way you built the model, number of nodes, and, and the, that sort of thing? We really just arbitrarily picked an embedding size for this common embedding size. So I think I may have picked 500 mm -hmm. as the size of the embedding. So literally like 500 numbers that represent code and 500 numbers that represent language. So as far as what the space looks like, you can like visualize the space. And if you do that, like let's say you visualize the representations for the code, you'll see like code sort of grouped together. You'll see like machine learning code, you'll see web code, maybe some other infrastructure code, different topics basically, and they're kind of grouped together. It reinforces like there's some semantic meaning that's been captured by uh, these embeddings. Right. And the same thing for language. You can do kind of like a reverse look up, you can just write your own sentence about something and see what the closest doc string in the embedding space is. And if you can do that check, you can, you'll can you see, oh yeah, you, you're getting very simi similar uh, doc strings to the one that you, you are supplying uh, in the embedding space. So that's kind of how it feels and looks and how you can inspect it from a human sense. I know that a lot of those systems and a lot of natural language processing methodologies in general 
tend to do better the larger the corpora you're able to give it. Can you tell me a little bit about your data collection process and how many documents, or I don't know if you call them documents, is it single pieces of code or snippets or whatever, but how much data have you amassed to get the project to the state it's at today? For this project, I use a publicly available data set, not something collected from inside GitHub, but rather from outside GitHub. There's an there's a excellent open source project called GitHub Archive. It's also uh, sponsored by some generous people at Google who is essentially scrape GitHub public repositories and put it in BigQuery. BigQuery is an interface where you can, you can go on Google Cloud and you can query all of this GitHub data. And so that's the mechanism I used to actually get this because I wanted to make give people sort of give an end-to-end tutorial and show folks how to get this data themselves and other data for other languages if they wanted to. Um, and so I used that and I amassed, I think, a little bit over a million distinct Python methods and functions and doc string pairs. Um, there's a lot more things that without doc strings and without you know our code that maybe wasn't well formed and that couldn't be parsed, but that was part of the cleaning process. The first step was to get all this code, kind of blobs of code. Basically, it's what the data looks like. It's this text. And, you know, there's doc strings and code together, just like how you would expect. The next step is to use something called abstract syntax trees. Every language has some kind of parser built in. So, for example, Python has the module called AST. And you can use that to parse Python itself. Um, and it will, you know, it will parse the text and it will tell you this is a comment, this is a function, this is a method, and so on and so forth. So we use that to extract the doc strings and the code separately and sort of to parse all of this text into its constituent parts. And then we do some cleaning, some deduping, because there's a lot of duplicate code out there that's really important. And I should mention, like, in the blog post, I limited it to some notion of popular repositories, something that had at least a couple of stars or at least, you know, some level of activity, um, because there's definitely a lot of noise. So I just had some rough heuristics to kind of try to get a little bit higher quality data set. Listeners, if you could see my calendar, you would not be envious. I'm desperately overbooked, but I can always find five minutes a day. And I use that to check out the brilliant.org problem of the day. I mean, sure, I aspire to take more of their courses, and I do from time to time, but I make sure not to miss their daily problems ever. In fact, let's do some multitasking here. I'm going to do the problem of the day right now. Oh, there's two today. One in science and engineering, titled Noisy Night Sky, and one in math and logic, titled Rational or Irrational. Well, that's definitely the one for me. Let's check it out. Today's math and logic problem is an interesting one. There's a a spiral of triangles. I see some right angles and some measurements. Man, I've got to figure this one out. And really, you have to see the image to appreciate it. I'm being asked, what is the length of H, the longest line segment? And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know the answer right away. I know the square root of 2 is going to be involved somehow. And I'm going to hurry up this ad so I can go and do this problem. You know, I find I need constant challenges to keep my math up. And that's why I love the challenges I find at the Brilliant Daily Problems. And the other reason I get over there every day is because the daily problems expire if you're not a subscriber. And if you just got back from a long vacation like I recently did, hoping to catch up, that's the time to go premium. And Brilliant is super affordable for anybody. So what are you waiting for? You can go try it for free at brilliant.org slash data skeptic. Finish your day just a little bit smarter. We thank brilliant.org for their continuing support. And we've worked out a deal with them. So the first 200 of you to sign up via our link get 20% off the annual subscription. Totally worth it. And with it, you can view all of the daily problems in the archive. Those alone make it worth it, let alone all the great courses they've got. So if you've got five minutes a day, use Brilliant Daily to challenge yourself. Do that at brilliant.org slash data skeptic. One more time, that's brilliant.org slash data skeptic. So you're talking about working only in Python then, if it's all doc strings as the language component, correct? Yeah, so this example was Python. And the reason I chose that, it's it's important when you're doing this problem, any machine learning problem, 
to get familiar with the domain and to be familiar with the data you're working with. And in this case, being a data scientist, I'm very comfortable with Python. And so I naturally gravitated towards that as a, as a data set rather than some language that I don't know anything about. And it would be hard for me to debug if something went wrong with the parsing of the language and other things. As I'm thinking about uh, the models you built, I know that you know attention is a big component of good natural language processing systems because we need to sort of remember what happened earlier in a sentence or earlier in a paragraph. And the same is true in code, right? C certain lines at the beginning of a function might be highly relevant for some activity going on at the bottom. Did you have to do any tweaking or, you know, hyperparameter tuning in that regard to suit your work to fit the code language examples you were working with? Yeah, so, okay, I, I hear kind of two questions. One is about attention. So actually, in the blog post, I don't use attention. But in my current research, I'm using a, a completely new architecture, which is one model to learn a joint vector space between code and language. In the blog post, there's three models kind of you know, all working together. It's a little bit more complicated, or it's a lot more complicated, actually. Uh, I don't use that attention mechanism. I kind of kept it as simple as possible. Um, you don't need, you can just use basic approaches and you can get really far to get people excited about doing more. But I will share that attention does, in the, in the new research I'm doing with the one model that learns a joint vector space, it actually makes a, a huge difference if you want to treat code as natural language. The second question for the hyperparameter tuning, I, I did some limited tuning, but not much. The hyperparameters I tuned were mostly learning rate and the number of parameters in the model, so either the number of layers or the number of nodes in each layer. I kind of gravitated towards keeping it as the, the minimal uh, complexity that works because I wanted to keep it simple for the blog. That was my other goal of hyperparameter tuning, was to simplify it as much as possible. So you, I think you'd alluded to this a little bit earlier, that a lot of the libraries out there and code examples and the folk wisdom about how to do these sorts of projects, it's really biased heavily towards people working on natural language. There isn't so much on code exactly. Based on your experience after this work and, and into your continued work as well, do you have any wisdom for the different challenges between tackling these two similar yet different problems? I'm actually really fortunate to work with some really great researchers in this area of uh, doing machine learning on code. As you are aware, GitHub was acquired by Microsoft recently. There's some people out there that have been researching this topic for some time and have studied doing machine learning on code, but I'm taking advantage of the structure of code. So one idea is to represent code as a graph and to make the edges of the graph you know, there's different relationships that you can have in code. So there's something called control flow, there's data flow, um, and there's other types of connections that you can have between different variables in the code. And actually represent code as a graph and then use something called a graph neural network to try to extract features from the code. That is an ongoing bit of research. And there have actually been some papers that released. The colleagues that I have, Miltos and Mark, at Microsoft Research that have shown the really good results on certain tasks that are an improvement of natural language approaches. There's uh, ongoing research on leveraging that type of technique and even combining it with the natural language technique to do these tasks. Uh, that's what I'm working on right now. One of the examples in the blog post that caught my attention was uh, when you were showing how the semantic search works, the search was create interactive plot. And what the first result was, was a nice little snippet of matplotlib code, the type of code that a, you know, fledgling Python programmer finds himself looking up quite often, you know, just to do all the fine tuning and tweaking. And nowhere in that code snippet did the words create interactive plot appear. Uh, it, it's obviously not a leap. It's the correct answer, but it's, it's a surprising result. Do you have any similar results that you're fond of in the, once you got to playing around with the models? Yeah, kind of the, I guess the flagship example that's the headline on the blog is the ping REST API and get results. And then you'll see the results don't contain the word ping or REST or API or any of that. But that's what that code does. It's actually hard to find those examples because people do, a lot of times people do a good job of, name, of uh, 
naming their variables and making it informative. You would think that you would write code to where even if you don't have comments in the code, based on the variable names and the naming of things, you would get an idea explicitly almost what that code does. So it is hard to find examples sometimes that don't have any intersection whatsoever between code and the description of what that code does. That's why I like that example. It really helps to illuminate what semantic search is. Absolutely, yeah. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about ways in which you see projects like this expanding in the future? Maybe touch on some of your current work and things you're excited about in the field? Yeah, I think this type of search would work well when you try to scope it to a repo or a user or an organization, kind of like cases where you said, where you know there's code in this repo or in this uh, area that does something, you just can't seem to find it. I think that would be a big boon to people being onboarded onto projects. I also can see that, you know, you can, because you can, you're learning representations of code, you mentioned earlier that code is very English centric. And then right now, when you're searching for code in, in the discourse of code, whether that's like issues on GitHub or even Stack Overflow or anything like that, it's very English centric. I can imagine it's hard to find code if you're not an English speaker. This will be really exciting, this representational learning of code, because this could allow you to map any language to this vector space. So you can find code regardless of your native language. And that's powerful, to bring more people into the fold of writing code and be a more inclusive profession. Well, to wind up, um, you know, this probably would have helped me a lot earlier today if uh, it had been rolled out into production GitHub. What are the chances we'll see uh, that you've planted a seed here and eventually users of GitHub will have access to powerful search technology like this? You know, I, this is still a very active area of research. Uh, there's no promises that I can make there. Um, we still have to really vet it out and test it and see if there's something that will really work. And in the meantime, you know, we are improving our search, or the, the search that we have, making sure that it works and adding functionality and baseline functionality to that uh, as well. So, you know, it depends on many things, but I, I'm pretty hopeful that this is going somewhere and it will help the community in one way or the other. It might turn up in search, it might turn up in some other feature like bug detection, but I think it's a fruitful area of of investigation. Definitely. I have a strong feeling that uh, in the next, I don't know, 10 years down the road, I'm going to say something about back when I was your age, we didn't have this. Uh, it really feels like uh, we're on the verge of having this breakthrough and it's going to change coding quite a bit, I imagine. Yes, I see a lot of people involved in this space. I actually have seen demos from different folks doing semantic search of code and doing machine learning on code and all kinds of startups doing things like fixing your code automatically. I've seen a lot of uh, different intelligent conversational type of bots with limited functionality, but still useful doing things like assisting people with code reviews. You know, our developer tools haven't changed in a very long time. Uh, that's really interesting. I think there is, like you said, a ripe opportunity to really have like a step change in, in, in our tools. Absolutely. Well, one of the great parts about the blog post as well is you've shared open source all of your resources, and it's an open data set, so this is a very repeatable process. What would it take for someone to fire this up and walk in your footsteps? Yes, I would say, um, you know, one thing that will make uh, things easier is to avail yourself of the Docker container so that you don't have to install everything from scratch and get all the dependencies working yourself, you know, use that and use your favorite cloud provider, whether it's AWS or GCP or Azure, get a decent GPU instance, or if you have one at home, that's fine too. I definitely would use the Docker container because that eliminates a lot of complexity with getting started. And I think that's why I have this Docker container, because I think that's where people can give up if they tried to do it without that. Well, Hamill, thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting about the project. This is really exciting and uh, I think really novel and interesting work. And I'm glad it's open source that people can follow it and maybe find new and innovative ways to be inspired by it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would be thrilled to have people check out the repo and comment on their ideas and their learnings.